and welcome to Ashford's Unlocking AI podcast series, focusing on the power to disrupt, how AI will change business and the law. If you're interested in finding out more, visit our AI Spotlight Hub on our website, ashfords.co.uk, for more AI insights. The Hub brings together commentary from our Ashfords experts, our clients, and our contacts across a wide range of areas, looking at how AI might impact business and the law as its use evolves. So welcome to the latest episode of the Ashford's Unlocking AI series podcast. I'm Anna Sher, I'm a partner in our commercial litigation team, and I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Liam Tolan and Claire Boucher, who are both senior associates in the team and lead sub-teams in their respective areas of specialism. Today, we're going to be having a chat about AI in the legal profession. First things first, I've got to say I'm mildly surprised that we've decided to take our debates out of the far corner of the third floor and make them into a podcast, but here we go. Um, thank God for editing. (laughs) So I thought we'd start off our discussion on what we think about the headlines and the articles we're seeing, which suggest that AI is going to be the start of a legal revolution. Um, I'm really intrigued to hear what you both think. Claire, what are your thoughts? So a legal revolution, it does sound a bit dramatic, but I think actually it's, it's probably accurate. For me, it kind of, I think it, it, I was thinking about this last night, how do I feel about this? And it kind of feels like, I think, where you've got on a roller coaster and the bars come down and you're at the point of no return and you know you're about to go on this journey and you're kind of thrilled, but you're also a bit scared and you don't really know what's going to happen, but you know something is and you're in. Definitely. Liam, how about you? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right in the sense that actually we can only speculate where it's going, but we know we're going somewhere with it. And and I think key for me is the fact that the judiciary, so obviously we're three litigators and what we do is we we put cases in front of judges. And the fact that very senior judges are already alive to how AI is going to affect the justice system signals to me that actually we need to get behind this as as quickly as possible and make sure, because normally you find in Sometimes with the English legal system, it, it's slow to pick up on technological changes. Here, I think that the thing is that they want to be at the forefront. And I think in the English legal system, it will get to the point where every single case we're dealing with will have an AI element, whether or not that's in terms of how the judges are approaching the cases, which I still think is quite a distance off, or whether it's more about how we're approaching cases and the tools that are available to us to make us more effective litigators. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone that doesn't take that on board really quickly will soon get left behind and and will end up doing their clients a disservice. I think as lawyers as well, some of us are kind of embracing technology and always have. Some of us are perhaps a bit more old school in our ways. And I think what we forget sometimes is that, you know, we've been through a lot of change, not just as lawyers, but in technology, we've seen emails come Mm -hmm. into existence in the 80s and 90s, and business was completely changed by that. And so this is something similar. It's just as big. And, you know, we're not scared of emails anymore. It's just part of our daily life. And I think perhaps artificial intelligence will get to that point. It will just become the norm, but it's the journey. Definitely. You've just aged us there by (laughs) by acknowledging that emails came in during our career. Um, I thought it was really interesting. I saw a statistic which said that 58% of UK lawyers were positive about the widespread use of AI in the workplace. But interestingly, 49% of those who were spoken to were more concerned about how it was regulated and how it was dictated and had a real focus on the fact that the legal profession needs to determine how AI is used within our profession rather than it being dictated to us by government. And I thought that was a really interesting statistic. Yeah, I think that's all in very early days, isn't it, at the moment? No one really knows how it is going to be regulated. There's a white paper in existence, but that's basically what it says. It's all kind of under review and, yes, it it will be regulated and something will happen in the future but who knows what how do we personally feel about it because I at first when I first started reading about this I'll be honest I was like well five years I'm gonna have to find a new career when you're not gonna need us it's all gonna be computers robots so on and so forth I suppose the more we read the the more we question that but I'm intrigued to hear what your thoughts are. so I, I take a completely different view on that I don't think this is sort of an existential crisis for lawyers it's not the death of lawyers and I think actually again coming back to us as litigators I think 
there will be a, a huge and necessary part of what we do is the service we provide, which AI is never going mm. to take over. Um, I think transactional law is going to be perhaps more fundamentally affected by this, but actually I spend a, a huge amount of my time advising clients from a kind of almost a human point of view. It's, it's how the, the dispute that they're involved in is impacting them, it's impacting their business. So the idea of a, a robot lawyer being able to do any of that, I think is proper science fiction. Whereas actually, I think what it's going to do is change our practices. It's going to change what we do when we've got a batch of documents and how we review them. It's going to change how we perhaps write a letter or how we receive a letter when we look through it. And we can also scan it into some technology, which perhaps tells us where there's judicial authority on a particular point so that when we reply, we've got some tools in our arsenal to go back and say, well, actually, you've said this. We would say that that can be defeated by you know, these four arguments. Yeah. And actually, those four arguments haven't necessarily come out of our head or our huge bank of legal knowledge. They've come because we've run it through an AI model that kind of can trigger those points. So I think it's really exciting. I think there's a huge danger of whilst AI can massively level the playing field, I think there's a risk that it can also be hugely prejudicial mm. as well right. in terms of it, equality of arms. So, you know, that, that can be one of the biggest differentiating factors in how a case is run when you've got a, you know, a very deep pocketed opponent on the other side that can spend all kinds of money on litigating something and, and perhaps you don't have that same budget. If they've then got access to all these sort of tools that can do a lot of the job for them and you know, the other side is a litigant in person, for example, the judiciary, the court system will have to find a way to prevent that having too much of a prejudice on people. I think that equality of arms point as well, if we step back from the kind of day-to-day -day litigation and case-by-case -case analysis, it works in terms of the profession generally. As with all of these reforms, I think it's going to change the shape of the legal market. There are going to be firms who are able to respond to AI becoming the technology that we use and adapt to its use. There are going to be lots of smaller firms who in the same way that they couldn't respond to fixed cost regimes are going to struggle to keep up with that pace of change. And I think what we may see is the smaller firms coming out of the market and end up with fewer but larger players. I think that's a, re a real potential yeah, as well. Yeah, I think that's completely right, Anishé. And I think it's probably fair to say that AI isn't going to replace lawyers, but lawyers who use AI will replace lawyers that do not. Yes, agreed. Completely agree. That's punchy. That should be a tagline. Um, <laughs> if, do you know, I, I'm a bit of a geek. And when ChatGTP first came out, I went and sort of started asking loads of questions to sort of test it. And Shocker. What, yeah, one of the questions I asked it was, why are our human lawyers better than AI lawyers? So I thought, turn the technology on itself. And actually, it came up with loads of reasons. So I, I wrote them down. But one is the fact that actually humans can understand in context. Whereas if you're putting something through a, a language model, for example, the content isn't necessarily there. Humans obviously have their own biases, but who knows what biases are built into an algorithm and all of those sorts of things. So actually it produced a long list of things that basically came up with the same conclusion you just reached, Claire, is that human lawyers can be improved by AI, but won't be replaced by it. Completely agree. And that actually really neatly moves me on to the next thing I wanted to discuss. Love a segue. Which is the idea of AI replacing our judges. And... How, what that will look like, what that will mean for our justice system, how do we ensure that the values which underpin our legal system here in, in England and Wales, and some of those values such as judicial independence, ensuring there's no discrimination in, in the judicial system, and frankly, taking it all the way back to year one of law school, the rule of law, how does all of that prevail in a world of AI judges? Can it? Claire, if you don't mind, I'll take the opener on this one because I've got fairly strong views on it um, and they actually start with my view that we will never get to a system where judges are replaced by robots in the same way we wouldn't get to a system where lawyers are replaced by robots but we still have to look at how the so going right back to that first thing I said about you know the judiciary is showing an interest in this and the senior judiciary so Jeffrey Voss said and he's the master of the roles that actually there will come a time in the not too distant future that AI machines are taking minor judicial decisions. And I think that's probably where it's going to end because actually if you are getting an AI decision-making tool to make major decisions in litigation, you know, taking outside of that, you know, family proceedings, all of those things, I just don't think that there will ever be the confidence in the general public that 
is needed for, for us to say, look, we can trust a, a, a robot or a machine with that kind of fundamental decision making. What do we think would be classed as minor decisions? Sorry to take over your no, comparing. Feel, <laughs> no, feel free. I mean, I, I suppose we've seen it in some other jurisdictions and countries. China, they will u- already use AI for what they call minor legal matters. But if it involves criminal proceedings, it's it can't touch it. If it involves uh, an individual's home and residence and fundamental human rights, then they're not going anywhere near it. And I think that's got to be right, because certainly at the stage we're at now with AI, AI makes its decisions based on previous decisions and assessing what's happened before in order to predict what's going to happen in the future we as you know we evolve what's acceptable evolves so we can't have something making decisions purely based on historical decision making how does ai evolve without some form of human input and i think because of the importance of those decisions in your criminal courts your family courts where your fundamental human rights exist, I, I can't see right now how the decision making could go beyond. Yeah, I, I think that's got to be right. But actually, we do know already that judges, or at least a judge, is using AI. So there was a court of appeal judge very recently that came out to say that he had used AI to help him draft a, a court of appeal judgment. That was Lord Justice Burrs, and he described it as jolly useful. And the way he said that he used it was to effectively, he had to write a passage in his judgment on a, a particular area of law. So we went along to chat GTP and said, tell me about the law of, I don't know what it may have been, misrepresentation. And it wrote a paragraph out there setting out what the law as it stands was. And he says, that's absolutely fine for judges to do that because all it's really doing They're is being, it. it's, it's a reference tool. It's coming up with some drafting for them. And actually, the thing that he made really key in that speech was, and I take responsibility for what I'm writing in that judgment. And that's the key thing, isn't it? Taking it all the way back to where this bit of our discussion started. The public have to have trust in the judiciary, in the legal system generally. People don't mind what you've just described happening because there is a highly experienced judge checking the output of AI before it is determining something which affects an individual or their business or something like that. In the same way that our use of it as lawyers, the customer has to be able to trust the legal advice they're given. And at the moment, I don't think the public at large have that degree of trust in AI, and it's going to take a long time to get there. And also, how would you have a system of appeals? You know, your first decision is made by, you know, Terminator 100 or whatever it might be, T2000. Then you, for whatever reason, dispute that decision. Currently, we've got a system of appeals. Does that then go to three computers deciding it for you? And, and how does that change it? You can, I, I think it would be impossible to have a an appeal system. Maybe the answer to that is you have a judicial decision made by a robot in the first instance, which you have the right to have appeal to human level or something like that. I think another factor as well that we haven't really touched on yet is the point about emotion. And I know that you know decisions aren't meant to be made with emotion, but the reality is that emotion is installed in a human and it is going to play a part in the consideration of facts and, and the outcome of something. And you know, you, you're going to have tons of cases where you have two sets of facts, you have the law, there's not necessarily a black and white answer. And when the answer is grey, we all know that a judge isn't necessarily just going to look at, you know, what is right and wrong. They're also going to look at what is fair and decisions have to be led by some form of emotion. So I don't know what the answer is, but, you know, how is that going to be? And it's similar to we were talking about litigants in person. The role of a judge where you have an unrepresented party at the moment, where there isn't a parity of arms between the the parties, the judge does have to tap into and read that courtroom, read what's going on before them and assist in justice. So ensuring there's a fair trial. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And circling back to to your point, Claire, is that how often do we spend time with clients not necessarily advising on the law, but maybe advising on the optics of something or how that a certain thing might... You know, reach the sympathies of a judge. You know, a judge will be sympathetic to this. How can you tell what a robot's going to be sympathetic to? And of course, you know, what 
ends up happening is that lawyers would eventually evolve to getting very adept at working out how the algorithms work and knowing exactly what information to put that will suit the algorithms and then you're almost you're manipulation not, it's, it's, it's you're not it's not then justice is it it's working out which buttons i have to press on the machine to make it say yes no or otherwise and so where, like you said on appeals where does that go because at the moment you can appeal if it's outside the range of reasonable responses well there can be any number of reasonable responses to a question do eventually we trump the top bot with a human, where, where does it end? Well, perhaps the answer is that all of these uh, judgments will be flawless and you won't have to worry about an appeal because whatever the computer says is right. Sorry, court of appeal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, judges will be out of jobs as well as lawyers. But I think actually the fact that we have that kind of woven into our justice system, I just don't think it can be unpicked in you know, 10, 20, 30 years. You know, this is you know, very much sort of completely speculating so so I, is this the, is the reality of what we're saying is we think it's going to play a role it's going to be assistive not replace but there is a risk that in terms of roles at the maybe entry level of the profession we're going to see a greater impact so the more administrative roles they could feasibly be impacted far more than say a judge's role in the legal system will some way off that do we think there's a risk that the ai erodes that entry level to the profession or those roles within the profession and where does that leave us then in terms of we all started in those roles we didn't all arrive at the place we are now and and is there a risk there i mean i think the answer to that is that the entry level to the profession will just look a bit different so it might not be that you spend those days of being a junior lawyer doing document reviews in that kind of same manual way, but you'll instead be interacting with the AI tool that might assist you in all of that. But let's and not ignore the fact that the younger population coming through this profession are much better at technology than, than the older box. I mean, you'll have to so sit upstairs actually, for five minutes. Actually, maybe this is all going to work in their favour. <laughs> Dangerous though, isn't it? Because certainly the way I learned was sitting in an office, listening to those I worked for, learning through imitation yeah. and seeing how they did it, that's going to be eroded to a certain degree if, if we go down this route. And the, the other real risk we have is lots of the information and knowledge within our profession sits in the very highest ranks of the profession who are not putting everything online, which means if they fall out of that end of the profession without it being captured... But AI is coming in and assessing all of the material absent that, then we lose all of the value of... of yeah, I think you're right. I think what we end up losing is experience. And let's say you know that experience is possibly then replaced with knowledge, isn't it? In the sense that you've got a AI learning tool that can effectively hoover up every single book there is and understand it in a way that it can then spit it out in context of what you want it to do. So I just think it's just an evolution. But again, litigation particularly is just the experience is so valuable about you know predicting how someone might respond to the letter you're about to send and all of those sorts of things. So I just, I, I can't see this being the death of lawyers. Taking it slightly Further back, though, you know, let's say putting aside all of the kind of like the moral arguments and all of the, you know, is it justice to do? I think in one sense, a, a court judgment is probably something like an AI learning tool could effectively replicate. Because if you think about it, what goes into a trial, you've got witness, you're, you've got your, your pleadings, so your, your particulars of claim, how you say your case is. You've got the defence that the defendants say, all written down, witness statements, all written down, expert evidence, all written down, and then you have a trial. So you'll have submissions, you'll have skeleton arguments from the barristers, you'll have the transcripts of the witness evidence given, all written down, all of which could be plugged into a computer. The output of that is a judgment. So if you do that 10,000 times over, I, I imagine... You know, a, a machine would learn pretty quickly and to the extent that it could actually develop styles of certain judges and it could write a whole judgment. I'm only smirking because we're at a dinner with some of the judiciary tomorrow night. Do you think we should raise and it? And I'm going to tell them that it's your view that they're no longer required. <laughs> no, on a moral level, on a justice level, absolutely we need them. But I think looking at it as a pure sort of geeky, what could this do? I think it would be like a really interesting, I mean, it would be a very expensive exercise. <laughs> I think, you know, you have everything that goes into a judge's decision 
ought really to be able to be reduced to the evidence that's before the court, which, if in paper form, you know, words, witness statements, could all be digested by a large language model, which is what most of this AI is. You know, it's, it's possible that you could end up seeing that in 30 years' time, maybe not now. Absolutely. I mean, in true lawyer style, we've talked about ourselves and our profession for the last however long. What do we think about for some of our clients? Are there particular sectors, markets, types of clients who we think are going to be affected more than others. Each of you have your respective areas of specialism. Claire, obviously you deal with fraud matters. Are there any of your clients or particular sectors you think are going to be impacted more than others or uh, sooner than others? Yes, so I I deal with civil fraud and a particular sector that I think will be impacted the most is the financial sector. So there's financial crime, financial fraud. And I think the fact of the matter is that it kind of is going to go both ways for clients in that sector. So AI will help to detect fraud, but it will also assist fraudsters in committing fraud. So yeah, it really is a very prominent topic for clients in that sector. I think we're also seeing, like we've got some clients in the asset finance space, and I know one of the early developments that they've made in response to AI is rather than having teams of underwriters sat there assessing things, they are now using AI to underwrite lending, which I think is a really useful tool for them. But again, you've got a whole group of individuals who are effectively other than in a supervisory or fact checking role effectively redundant which I think we'll see across the board as well yeah I mean I did I had a think about kind of three points of advice that we could give to clients to help think about AI and potentially protect themselves from any issues and the first one is I think it it just goes without saying that clients in all sectors will need to really know their client it's so important now to go through that due diligence stage and know who you're dealing with and if possible try and get your verifications from third parties from companies house from registers from verification companies I think that's obviously going to be much more independent than it is from getting it from your client directly and the second one is to ensure that your kind of alertness as to potential fraudsters and the kind of powerfulness of AI and in, in impersonation, et cetera, is monitored. So make sure that you've got a contact at your client and you've seen them face to face. In the extreme, you might want to come up with a code word between you and, and your client to know that when you speak to somebody there that, you know, it's definitely somebody at that organization. Because a small measure like that may seem ridiculous, but, you know, with the future that's coming, it, it could save a whole lot of bother if things go wrong. Definitely. And the risk is both ways, isn't it? Because whilst you have to have those parameters in place from that angle, equally, where you're relying on it and using it as a tool, it's about understanding the risk that that presents and building in processes so that you don't blindly rely on AI. Because as we've seen, it isn't 100% accurate, it can't be 100% accurate at the moment. And therefore, to limit your own risk, come and speak to us, we can we can we can show you how we can talk to you about the risks of what you're proposing, and so on and so forth. But it's it's just about not being naive to the risk that there is in using all of these tools to make your day to day business and life easier. Yeah. And the third point, is to make sure that your staff are all trained so there's a greater awareness amongst all levels as to what to look out for, to look out for patterns and things. And it might be that you will want to go external for that training for somebody that really knows you know, what kind of patterns are important in whichever sector that the client is in. I mean, in the wrong hands, that kind of AI technology can be used to sort of really kind of hone a, a kind of a, a fraud or a scam, can't it? If you think about those spear phishing emails you get where it says, you know, I'm, I'm stuck at somewhere and I'm, you know, this is your daughter and I need X amount, you can normally spot that they are slightly jarring in terms of how they're oh, written. My dad literally engaged in a one hour WhatsApp conversation with somebody a, a week thinking ago it was you. thinking it was me. And only then messaged me to say, 
Have you lost your phone? <laughs> but if you think about you know, a, uh, an AI model that actually is designed to sound like an authentic human being mm. and you know, have those conversations, you could scale up your fraud exercise massively. So yeah. you know, you've got to be really alert to these things. I was um, reading the other day about Tom Hanks and how his identity mm. was stolen in a dental advert, but it wasn't just his voice. It was everything. It, it looked like him. It looked like he was talking. That's, that's really S- interesting. Selling dentistry. I do a lot of defamation. So ordinarily defamation would be a, a statement published about someone that, that effectively is you know, reduces their reputation. And one of the things I find, it, and we saw it with like the whole deep fake thing, which is, is the whole thing with Tom Hanks, isn't it? But w- what if you were able to generate an image of Anna Shea kicking a swan? You haven't said anything bad about her, but you've... You, yeah, so, sorry, actually, excuse you as an example. I'm sure you never would. But you've then, you've represented that she's done something awful. If that was on social media and it got it went viral... I'd come and see you immediately. You'd come and see me and I'd have to say, well, we're going to have to work out how the law is going to tackle this because this is you know AI taking us into a new unknown territory. So it's really interesting how people protect their reputation and deal with those sorts Slightly of things. Slightly terrifying at the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely, because you can't control it. And then it gets even more darker when you, you know, it can t- take you into the re- realms of revenge porn and all of those sorts of things. So it is really interesting how the law will respond to all of this. Uh, the other thing is it does obviously help as well, because you know, if you are concerned about your reputation and you can employ AI devices to, to monitor the internet, because obviously you know, as a human, you can't see everything's on the internet. But if you've got something which can assess whether a statement about you and you know, I'm not suggesting you or I have this because we haven't got that sort of reputation. But if you're a global superstar that trades on your reputation, that kind of uh, you know, gazing and you know, through an AI tool can also help protect your reputation. So it's it's like anything, isn't it, with technology and, and those sorts of advances? It comes with both risk and opportunity. Yeah, always, definitely. I suppose in terms of wrapping this up. It would be wrong not to just have a shameless plug in here. If you are one of our clients or you're not yet engaging with us, but you are thinking about using AI in your business place and you want to talk to us about how to make sure you're protected whilst doing that or to get some advice on how to deploy it or you're concerned, we have experts right across the firm. We are so happy to speak to anybody. Please do get in touch. You'll find all of the details on the website or alongside this podcast. But I think in conclusion, we're all agreed. There is absolutely nothing that can be done to slow the AI train down. There are clear advantages, as we've just alluded to, in pretty much every sector and market that we and our clients operate in. But hesitation and scepticism will remain until it becomes clearer, until we see how human oversight and control is going to be retained. I think that's just going to be a natural evolution. But thank you both very much for your time and your insight. And I hope that all of you listening found this discussion interesting. And hopefully you'll tune back in for our next episode. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank Thank you. you.